Restoring the Future, a series of four round tables on regenerative strategies for the Anthropocene transition. Welcome to the fourth round table in our series, Restoring the Future. I'm your host, Ken McLeod, speaking to you from the city of Sydney on the country that the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation have cared for over countless generations. I'd like to begin by honouring their elders, past, present and emerging, and to acknowledge that they never ceded their sovereignty to the British Crown or any of its successor post-colonial governments. Our guests at these round tables have been Fobel permaculture educator and urban agriculture pioneer Morag Gamble, regenerative culture author, educator, researcher and activist Daniel Christian Wall, Australian indigenous cultural ecologist and marine biologist Chels Marshall, and tonight's discussion leader, regenerative urban planner, developer, educator and animateur Jason Twill. Due to a death in her family, Chels will be unable to join us. I'm sure you'll all join with us in sending Chels and her family our condolences. Morag led our first round table on translocal regeneration. The discussion ranged over local food systems, bioregionalism and building translocal networks. In the second round table, Bioregional Economies and Subsidiarity, Daniel explored bioregional economic strategies designed to create conditions conducive to life. In the third round table, Chels led a discussion on re-indigenizing culture. She discussed how Earth-centric eco-cultural values must be the foundation of our efforts to create a viable post-growth world. Tonight we'll draw together these threads of bioregionalism, regenerative economics and core cultural values in a discussion about transforming human habitats to restore the ecological integrity of the Earth's biosphere. Thank you, Ken, and good evening everyone where you're calling in from, or good morning, or good afternoon. I'm Jason Twill, and before I begin, I want to acknowledge I'm calling in from Gadigal country in Australia, New South Wales, uh, on the land called Sydney, on the maps that you guys could see. Um, I want to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, acknowledge their culture. Um, please feel free to acknowledge First Nations people on, on the chat, wherever you're calling in from as well. Um, and I, you know, I thought a lot about how I can share time with you guys tonight. Um, and thank you for sharing your time with us this evening as well. And I hope that wherever you are in the world, that you're safe and sound with your family and, and, uh, and getting through these extraordinary times as much as possible. Um, my, my main message is that regenerative cities and regenerative urbanism is possible today with the right will, with the right governance, with the right cultural dimensions, the right economic architecture for society and humanity, and importantly, the right mindset that we instill. Um, but we still have a long way to go, but I have massive hope for that. And I, I learned a long time ago on my journey that I have to see the glasses overflowing. I can't see it half empty or half full. I have to see it overflowing to kind of transcend through the challenges that could weigh us down and know that hope is always on the horizon no matter what because of the will of people. Um, and then we are a back against the wall species and our backs are pretty far against the wall right now. <laughs> so hopefully we respond out of the crisis we're dealing with now, which is compounding with many other crises we're dealing with in the world, be it social inequality, be it racism, climate change, water scarcity, um, greed and power politics, whatever it may be, we always have hope we always have a way to transcend that. Um, and I'm grateful to be friends with the people on the call this evening and learn from them um, as friends and colleagues. But instead of just telling you what I think about, you know, how to do regenerative cities, I feel like it's better to share my own urban story and how cities have taught me. Um, Daniel heard a little bit about this when he interviewed me, but uh, it starts with New York. My heart home is New York City. My, my love affair with cities came from New York. 
um, because I was on the doorstep of New York in my pivotal adolescent years in the suburbs outside of New York, the suburbs that had no sidewalks, that was completely designed around cars, that was set up around status totemism and McMansions and uh, a lack of cultural diversity. It was very homogenous. homogenous. Um, and the urban co commute pattern of parents commuting into New York City for work and back every day, I called it the, well, in my, in my family situation, my father worked and my mother stayed home. Um, I called it the fatherless suburbs because I didn't see my dad during the week because he left before I got up and he got home after I went to bed. Um, and I, in high school, I started to notice the patterns of how the built environment shapes society in many ways. It shapes our attitudes, our behaviors, our social dynamics. Um, in my case, I noticed that every single one of my friends in high school's parents were divorced, including my own. Whether it was a strain of commuting or the way that I just started to see correlations of different things and there's certain behavioral habits that we as teenagers took on, some of which were drugs and alcohol abuse. Um, so that those formative years of my own development played a significant role of how I saw cities as a sanctuary. So it was in that kind of 14 to 18 year old age, I started to become an urbanist. And it was by spending a lot of time in New York City and eventually moving into Manhattan. Um, but it was crossing this threshold, you know, it's, it's Christopher Street, 7th Avenue, you know, subway line. And I remember, I, I'll never, till this day, it still strikes me as this kind of curtain that would I'd walk through into the urban domain and I'd be hit with tolerance, diversity, different languages, um, you know, an array of ethnicities around me. And, and, and I knew that I could be somewhere where I could let my shield down and be whoever I wanted to be and I can grow wherever I wanted to grow. And I can realize my full potential. And that was my first association with the power of cities and how they establish tolerance and diversity. Um, so later on, I, I, I wound up, you know, Tech, building a career within real estate development because I saw that as a, a leverage point. I had my awakening. The awakening I had was, um, uh, what is it called? The Rising Decline of American Med Landscape um, by, who knows that, anyone called it that? I'm forgetting his name. It's an amazing book. Um, but it's, it was basically a, an author who wrote a very accessible way to explain suburban sprawl in the 20th century. And it helped me, what I was trying to see or visualize in high school, it, it pictured, it, it, he wrote down everything that I felt and saw as a kid growing up um, and what cities do. So later on when I took on my role as in real estate in New York, um, New York also taught me two different various sides of cities. One, power politics but between government and industry and the forces that shape our cities or, or put force upon us not with us, but upon us. Gentrification, displacement, inequity, um, unfair banking, you know, banking policies that people can't get access to money to buy homes or have access to real estate. Um, and gentrification struck me, a really strong chord in me. And I saw a lot of my friends who were artists or in different socioeconomic communities in New York completely get displaced. And I could see the culture of those areas of the cities erode and become commoditized and franchised and different retail and, and you know, that, that corporate power politics play the role in shaping the city. On the other side, I saw the power of grassroots action and communities banding together to fight to keep their neighborhoods intact. Um, I learned a lot from the Hispanic community in the Bronx called Nos Quedamos, which means we stay. And they taught me the power of community to stave those power politics off and make sure that their culture, their home, that they worked hard to establish didn't just get bulldozed over and redevelop and displace them. Um, so the phenomenon of, you know, the commodification of cities is a really important one. And I saw my own neighborhood, I always share the same, like the story, that the retail is so important because it, it, it's, you know, the urban amenity around us creates really strong places and identity to place. And I just saw this recipe unfold in Manhattan where you had a pharmacy, a cell phone store, a bank, and, you know, like a, a, a something else. But like that, that, that pattern would repeat itself over and over again in the same store. Starbucks, you know, like would repeat itself. And just the commodification of the urban environment, which is really bad. 
Um, so I got a lot involved in social housing, um, learning the, the, the importance of financial architecture to enable industry to deliver more equitable housing, more equitable communities, more accessible places. Um, and not every city has that, and we're missing that. It's a really, it's a really global crisis in equity in cities right now. Now, what I also learned in that journey, um, I learned about from Ann Winston Spurn, who I think she was at MIT or E. Penn at the time, that cities are nature. I have this, you know, profound understanding through her book, Language of Landscape. It's, it's not about nature in the city or cities in nature, that cities are nature. They're a manipulation of human economies and how we structure our habitats around us. That everything around us came from nature. And we need to start seeing it, not the separateness between city and nature, but cities are nature. I learned a ton from Jane Jacobs. Um, she taught me how to see the city through a whole different lens. And again, that grassroots and the importance of integrity of the culture of cities and the importance of heritage and walkability and density and all these things that made a city dynamic and made it function for the people, not for industry and politics, but for the people and communities. Um, and as around that time, I also came across a gentleman named Chris Alexander. Many of you on the call might know him, um, pattern language. And I grabbed hold of that with everything, I, everything in my being. Um, he profoundly influenced me. And he taught me how to feel a city, to feel a place, the emotional connection I would get to place. So I started seeing a whole different light. And I started seeing cities through the lens of culture and movements, um, the Renaissance era. I lived in Florence for a while and I saw the power of what a movement can do to shape the dynamics and look and feel and functionality of the city. Um, Art Deco movement, Art Nouveau, the Austrian secessionist movement where like the architects, the artists of the day, the writers would come together and shape something that would create a vernacular of design that would shape the, you know, the whole era of a city. I feel like we're missing that right now from cities particularly place-based design because we have this global commodified version of real estate where where developers used to be local they're now global and money is basically you know creates a level of anonymity between developers and community and we're creating architecture of sameness everywhere else in the world so we're losing our cultural identity at place which is a fundamental pillar of regenerative cities in my in my own view but then I came across another gentleman named Henry George. And many of you on the call might have known in a blockbuster book that came out in 1892, which is as relevant today as it was when it was written back then during the Robert Barron era, because we just have new Robert Barons now. But Progress and Poverty is an incredible book. And it taught me basically everything we're fighting for, be it ecological degradation, be it social inequality, be it anything else, it all boils down to land and humanities, particularly Western humanities, commodification and privatization of land. So there's something in there. I studied at the Henry George Institute in New York, which is free. Um, there was a benefactor in the early, 19, early 19, 20th century that um, bequeathed the found, fund. So this Henry George Institute's all over the world. He was an economist who really had a profound way of looking at land in different ways and using land value taxation to change how we manage urban environments and manage growth in an equitable manner. But he was writing about the, the 99% and the 1% 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. Um, so I encourage people to, I'm a Georgist economist, he profoundly influenced me, and I'll get into how that's playing out now when I look at the future of cities towards the end of my talk. Um, now I'm going to shift from New York to Seattle. So that was my New York influence on me. Now I'm in Seattle. Seattle's a different, a different culture dynamic. So I went from like the hyper, you know, dynamic East Coast city of New York where, you know, it's this global city and everything happening to this incredible city in the Northwest that's evolved in, in the latter, you know, half of the 20th century and now from the tech giants like Microsoft and Amazon, and Google and others. But there was a distinct cultural nuance between New York and Seattle. The first day I went to work, I had a suit on because that's my New York you know, thing. And my boss said, no way, no suits in my office. And then I, you know, everyone dresses like you're going rock climbing or you're going skiing for the day. So there's a cultural association to sustainable urbanism there. And it's almost like stigmatized. If you're not buying something organic or, being, or buying clothing that's locally produced, 
or you, whatever it might be, it's, it's almost like you're not part of the social norm there. And that's, that's an important dynamic of who they vote for, for government, government to run the, the city or the state. And it's really where I started to understand what, how important progressive urban governance is. And it's one of the most progressively urban environments that it, Portland and Seattle in particular, of any place I've lived, they were like 10 years ahead of anyone else. But then we were also like 20 years behind Copenhagen. So it's all relative. Um, but we are working on uh, innovation district there called South Lake Union, but we established a partnership. It was a big mega project of like 60 acres of land, of, of old industrial land that was being converted into a mixed use community that had, you know, university laboratories, technology firms were moving in, housing for different levels of affordability, some affordable, some super luxury. So it was a very dynamic place, but we were also trying to push the boundaries on um, infrastructure for water energy mobility electric vehicles like everything we could push the boundaries on we were doing we were trying but it, it, we were able to do that and seattle became what i would call an investor ready city meaning because they looked at the link between regenerative urbanism or sustainable urbanism and economic development they knew they had to create the enabling conditions for us to do the never been done before like we wanted to have the confidence to go do an offsite water system or a distributed energy system or a biophilic design in a building, whatever it might be, they were there to meet us and they basically alleviated or reduced the red tape for us to do transformational development. And once that relationship was established and the kind of the governance model was established, you could do anything you wanted. And it was great. I mean, yes, there were some financial difficulties to get it through, but you know, this is this is the birthplace of living building challenge, right? So I'm on the board and, and co-founder of the International Living Future Institute. We're pushing living buildings as like this disruptive business model for the built environment. And anywhere we're looking at, it's illegal to build a living building, right? So it's illegal to do the right thing, build a building that has no adverse impact on the environment of society. Um, but the city of Seattle and Portland other cities were adopting new legislation because they saw like the limits of their regulatory environments from doing that. Um, but I also saw, you know, as good as the governance was and as progressive it was and as, as all the innovation we can do, we were still stuck under this, you know, ceiling of a uh, economy and how our built environment is valued and how the investment community looks at investing in our built environments, um, which created another ceiling. So we had to look at how we break through and transcend not the cost barrier for doing transformational development, but the investment barrier. Um, some of you might know Stuart Cowan, but we, we started a project 10 years ago called the Economics of Change, because we knew with living buildings and living communities, our engineers and architects and practitioners had the tools and knowledge to design buildings and infrastructure that mimicked, eco mimicked ecosystem services. And if we knew through ecological economics that we knew how to measure and monetize that, how do we bring that level of thinking and valuation into a real estate investment so we can actually transcend our limitations, which is by a large part across the world is probably green, like a green building rating system about second from the top. Green star five, lead, gold. That's pr pretty much where industry gets stuck beyond that. You have to pay more money for this you have to use integrated design if you want to do it for more you know less cost but there's still a point in a real estate investment where there's no further justification to spend money on this stuff because you're not matching the true value and right? so we try to come up with a whole new concept called integrated value and you know looking at the externalities and internalities and looking at how we can create a world of internalities where natural and social capital is measured and monetized in an investment so if you get beyond and do a regenerative building or a living building, there's money to help fund you to do that because you're dealing with a societal issue or an environmental issue that we're funding for anyway through government or philanthropy. So it's moving that money to the source impact of our environment. But it's really in Seattle I learned not that nature has to be protected from the built environment, but we have the resources and knowledge at hand to create built environments that are regenerative and we can contribute and restore the habitats around us through the, through the knowledge that we have. Um, Seattle was an amazing, amazing time. Um, and there were glimpses of indigenous urbanism. 
right? The iconography of Native American, you know, culture ingrained in the architecture, ingrained in the infrastructure of the city that told the story of the place, which was really cool. Then I came down to Sydney, um, an incredible country, an incredible place, deeply rooted. It goes back, we've talked about this 120,000 years, potentially, given the new um, middens they found in South Victoria. I think that's exciting to know that how, how far culture and country go back, and I respect that dear, dearly. But I look at the skyline of Australian cities, and I always like to say cities are like never-ending novels, right? New chapters are continually being written, but you can't lose the plot. They have to be coherent and tell a story of a place, its identity, its history, its values. And when I look across a lot of city skylines, in particular Sydney, what I see is like we value money, we like to move money, we store money, we make money, we count money. <laughs> If you look at the banners across all the buildings and certain point you start to see that we're losing our identity of place um, and there's an, there's an amazing um, philosopher that's Australian named Glenn Albrecht um, who came up with this concept called solastalgia which is the opposite of nostalgia and it was originally coined I think in the early 90s to talk about the way heavy mining and terraforming for mines and mineral you know, extraction in Australia was fundamentally changing the landscape of ancestral homes for Aboriginal people. And it started to see this phenomenon of feeling homesick, even though we haven't left because our environments are changing so much around us. And I'm starting to use that in the urban context because we're rapidly building our cities around us and it's changing the nature of our connection to place. Um, I started to associate that with my own time in Manhattan where like all these buildings change, all the, you know, the shop that I've been going to that's been there for 52 years is gone. You know, like it's being, you know, replaced by franchise. So family businesses that have been around for three generations, local businesses is like, it's destroying the culture and the identity of place. Um, maybe some of you feel that in, in the way you've been lived and engaged in cities, how fast they're changing around us. But I'm seeing hope on the horizon through a movement called community wealth building. And a lot of my time at Urban Apostles has been focusing on community-led housing, community-led urbanization, community-led owned institutions like banking systems, like businesses, worker cooperatives, essentially taking hold of a new era of democratic socialism where power is back and attributed to people and out of corporations and out of you know, centralized government. And the community wealth building movement going across the UK, across the US, it's merging here, is incredibly inspiring. When you're going into places like Cleveland and you're seeing you know, four generations of, of black communities that have been disenfranchised by that banking system, by that industry, by that government, and not had the same access because of the racial wealth gap to, to earn money and appreciate wealth over time, They've basically gone into these communities. This is a group called the Democracy Collaborative, who I work with a lot, um, and developed training programs, created worker cooperatives, and associated those worker cooperatives with anchor institutions in the city, like the government, like hospitals and universities, and provided jobs. But those jobs, those, those people in those communities are the owners of that business because it's a cooperative, worker-owned cooperative. So you're seeing for the first time women and men, and I visited them last year, and it was like a, a very emotional moment that the, this is a generation that's the first to own a home. Within five years of making money, being part of the cooperative, supporting each other, you know, three generations of grandma, mother, and children are being raised and have access to home ownership. And the sense of pride of kind of breaking the chains of inequity in those cities is huge. I see that kind of model of community wealth building and as a foundational element that regenerative urbanism can emerge from, you know, where people have control over the main institutions in their society, be it the banking system, be it cooperative farming, be it cooperative food, cooperative grocery stores, whatever it might be. Um, that's hugely important and it creates a hyper-local economy where we're vested in our place. Our, our dollar is how we spend and vote for the kind of place we want. Um, so I think that model is really, really vital to the architecture of what regenerative cities can emerge from in the future. Um, you then have the indigenous urbanism here. 
right? I li- I've only lived on colonized land my whole life, born in the U.S., you know, here, growing, being here for the last seven years. Um, there's something profound about this notion of indigenous urbanism. And I, that's what I've been working on with Chels for the last four years. And I, that's why you heard me last two weeks ago, like how important that relationship has been to teaching me and, and shaping my own mental model and my worldview. Um, and how a city can tell the story and lore of a culture that's been here as custodians for thousands, almost 100,000 years or more. You know, how that creates a center of gravity to make people want to see and experience and hear those stories, see those stories emerge through architecture, through art, through the shape of our city. Um, that's, that's like, that's missing because we tend to kind of create the urban grid and, and rush out over that. And uh, so there's a way to really build and emerge a city through storytelling that I think is, is missing in our, in our urban narrative today, which is hugely important. Um, and it's just the beginning to tap into. If you want to see it really starting to express itself uh, in advanced forms, Aotearoa, New Zealand is an incredible place. Naming rights, you know, how the language of, of Maori is embedded in the naming of places there and buildings um, and Maori architecture and Maori urbanism is really taking hold there. It's, it's, it's influencing um, K-Papa, however we call us, the white people, the Westerners. <laughs> Um, keep, 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 I can't forget the word. Um, but now you're also seeing with Kate Raywar's incredible work with Donut Economics, Donut Cities. So that's another one that I think, again, that governance model at a bioregional scale that we are designing and thinking about our cities within planetary boundaries, right? Within the biological caring capacity of our bioregions. And that needs to be embedded in the planning documentation. In the, you know, in the way we think about designing places and buildings, we always have to have a view that we're doing it within our one planet capacity, but matching that with human development indices, right? So making sure that social equality, gender equality, ethnic equality is all coming together. So it creates this wholeness in the space that we can design cities in, which Kate calls the regenerative economic zone. Um, that's a huge framework and if you look at way Amsterdam has worked with biomimicry and donut economics to kind of create this new urban governance model I see so much potential for that um, and my new journey is to Doha Qatar so I'm officially part of the Qatar foundation so I'm moving to my next urban experience I'm super excited about it um, to work for an incredibly profound foundation that's been there for 25 years creating economic social environmental transformation at scale. Um, and, you know, even had earlier talks tonight, the behavioral dimensions of this is super important. Every, every city I've been in had a different culture. I mentioned New York to Seattle, to Sydney. You know, I leave Portland, Seattle, and I'm wearing, you know, my Patagonia shirt. I look like I'm going rock climbing. I land in Sydney, and it's all suits. And, uh, so it's every, every place has a different culture, different needs. Um, but you have to draw from that. Um, so the behavioral dimensions of this is really important. And I know Daniel and I will have a chat about this when I bring it up, but technology does play a role. Um, looking at the way artificial intelligence and machine learning can support us on making everyday decision making. So it's not, a, I'm really a big advocate of human change, not climate change. We have to change the way we talk about that. In the fields I've been in as a built environment expert, we always say buildings are responsible for 60% of carbon emissions, blah, blah, blah. cities are responsible. It's like you're pointing a finger over there, it's us. We are responsible for that. We design those buildings, we plan those cities, we put the rules in place. Um, so we need to look at ourselves and the way we develop, the way we think about cities and then plan them. Um, and I'm working with some colleagues right now on an app that has artificial intelligence, but importantly, there's incredible work happening around the world on indigenous AI. So making sure that that artificial intelligence isn't just programmed from a Western paradigm, but from a First Nations paradigm as well, from an ethical perspective, so that it learns the way that it, the ontology and epistemology of First Peoples is, is being infused in that, which I think is crucial. Um, and that's happening here, it's happening in New Zealand, it's happening in North America. Um, so there's a global network in that space, which I'm really excited about. So that's the kind of stuff on the horizon, um, but how that can help 
I would say, catalyze humans and importantly decision makers over cities to make profoundly better decisions about how we evolve our cities, how we grow our cities to this realization of a regenerative urban paradigm. That's it. Let's go into the round table now. <laughs> Okay, so I've been very interested to to watch what's happened uh, that's grown out of the um, Bologna, where they've declared the whole city to be a commons. And uh, it has at least the potential, and I don't know whether you've got, you know, update information about what's, what's happening there, but it at least has the potential to transform local government. government. Have you got any views about uh, the value of developing the commons in an urban environment? Asking me that, or you want to, someone you want me to take that? Mm -hmm. I, I can I can build on that, so you can take on it even deeper. Oh. Because I, I was going to ask it that there is something very similar when you were talking about the commodification of the cities. I I've, I feel like what what Ken is now speaking to is exactly the answer to that of saying hi. There is something like I, I really like your framing of the of walking into this curtain of of like walking through this curtain and suddenly actually in, encountering an um, openness for diversity and cohabitation and 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 co-creation and all that in the center of a city and and how that is really in a way the essence of what what this hyperorganism this 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 like city as a living being city as a as as a multi um human being conglomerate that actually creates something that where the whole is more than the sum of its parts that all speaks to me to that there is something like an urban commons and that in in the pattern of eroding and enclosing the commons everywhere in the world there has been a parallel um, in closing of the urban commons, and and what Ken is speaking to is 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 actually um, to some extent the the process of trying to correct that. How how do you and and a lot of what you spoke to with with regard to um, community wealth building the work in the work in, in um, and it took so many notes um, in in Cleveland and what was the organization you were democracy something or other the democracy collaborative yeah so they yeah. that is the commons I mean it is commoning um, and they're partnered with all the gurus so like Michelle Bowen we've been you know working with here in Sydney with the Sydney Commons Lab but it's the common movement is amazing you know it's it's all inspiring so the work I've been doing the last five years has been actually more than that it's like the future actually going back to Seattle. Is basically the fusion of city making and the sharing economy. That's what Urban Apostles' specialty and focus is, because it's a really and peer to peer economy, not the Death Stars that we call like Uber and Airbnb. Those are not, that's just corporations under the guise of a sharing economy. Like the true community control of land and housing and assets in the community. Um, what I see as really fundamental underpinning of that are community land trusts. Um, so we've been working on a policy for this city here, but the community land trust movement is huge and growing like wildfire. And it gets back to that kind of Georgia's economic way of looking at it. But the land trust is basically cooperative on land, it decommodifies land. And it creates a permanent way to drive equity and affordability into a community and create community, strengthen community ties and local economy because the community runs that trust. They sit on the board, right? And it creates intergenerational equity over time. Um, Burlington, Vermont has one that's been operating for 35 years and makes up almost 20% of housing in Vermont, and sorry, in Burlington, called the Champlain Housing Trust. Incredible, incredible people. Um, Jonathan Davies, I think, is the person. He's like a guru, encyclopedic on this, but we've been working with that group in the UK and North America and here. So the community land trust movement is really, I think, crucial, underpinning of this commoning movement. One, it gives us community control of land, housing, but also business. Because what's also the decaying nature of cities is retail. Like Thirty percent of retail in New York is dying before COVID nineteen. Wait till we look. What wait, wait till what it looks like on the other end of this crisis. Um, 
So we're losing local businesses or the ability to evolve local businesses in our communities. Um, whereas when you have a land trust, because you're suppressing land value inflation over time, it's resale restricted, you're enabled to create an equitable ground plane on top of the equitable housing solution and create a really strong community. Um, I think it's a phenomenal model. And it's, it's one pillar of community wealth building. The other one is the anchor institutions and making sure you're, you're building the architecture of a really resilient local economy. Um, so let the anchors do their thing, but make sure they're tied to local cooperative movements so you can hire the people, keep money flowing within the communities so we're not like, what we call money being sucked out into that casino-like economy you have around the world, the globalization movement. Globalization is good and bad, but um, when it comes to, I think, equitable city making, you have to change the power structure and the power has to go back to the community. That's what I've learned on my journey. So the comedy movement, I think, is huge. And the sharing economy. Yeah, I think that the, the commons movement as well is such an important part of thinking about food in the city. Um, because as well as you mentioned about, you know, seeing city as nature, and I also think we need to sort of see city as farm. And we think about our whole metabolism in the city. You know, it's not just about the buildings and the culture. It's also about the things that sustain us as well. You know, like where where is our water coming from? Where is it going to? Where is the, where is our food coming from? How is that integrating with the the life systems that support the city and, and uh and, and where is that grown and on what land is that grown? And so the, the, where, where, where we've been working a lot is really exploring how we can create um, community land trusts uh, for, for agricultural projects. Uh, you know, some of the, the projects um, going in and around, say, the city of Brisbane, there's, uh, com- there's, there's a land that's being put aside by the government for, uh, for nature. You know, like it's a community money that is raised through a levy and used to buy up really important bushland. So we need to kind of take a similar thinking in terms of actually thinking about citywide. Where is our agricultural land? So in 50 years' time, for example, where is our food coming from? Who's going to be growing it? Is it is it some of the best agricultural land in and around our cities? And what are the you know and and how are we how are we managing and and protecting that? And I think that's kind of a really important part. And and where is the water coming from? Because you know we are having these sort of you know like water is is becoming more scarce in a lot of the agricultural areas further out from the city. We need to be thinking about how we can get the nutrients in the water back from the city back um, out. To these these food producing areas, and then also thinking about the commons in and around the cities uh, that are used, for example, for cars. I don't know; you probably have a better figure than me, Jason. But what I can see in some places, it's thirty percent of of the city landscape. The commons is put aside for cars. In some cities, like Los Angeles, it's probably about a half. So when we start to think differently about the becoming more hyper local maybe we can then start to think more differently about what happens to those commons like returning them back to nature returning them back into into farmscapes so i think about some of the cities like um lubiana for example right next to the center of town is this beautiful green way that connects out out to the countryside and comes back in it's where all the farmland and the wild spaces happen and it's this this thread, it's an artery. It feels like it's this living system. And so, you know, thinking about daylighting the creeks and, and daylighting the soil as well and bringing that back to life so that it can then feed the city and the city can feed it. And I, I think we need to kind of bring bring life back. And it's, and it's also about the relationship to place directly in relationship to our food, I think, we can't start to really connect with our commons until we deeply connect with place and also start to work out how we can build relationships to work with other people in this way. Otherwise, it's always someone else doing it for us. And I'm speaking about that particularly from my experience, say, for example, in the community garden movement, that it was when people came together and they dreamed these spaces and they entered into the shared um, open space and started to imagine what it could be and then created these urban farms. 
But when it gets starting to replicate and someone goes out and say, great, a community garden is an excellent idea, we'll pop one in here, we'll pop one in there, and it no longer becomes the commons, it just becomes a commodity. And it shifts everything, everyone's relationship, relationship to it, how it works, how it functions, how people manage it. Um, and so, yeah, coming back into that commons and thinking about deep relationship to place and community and um, I think also just allowing empty bits to be available for the imagination to emerge. When we fill space up too much, we don't leave space for that emergence from the communities. Um, but I think I, the, just just before I, I hand it back over again, I think um, you know, there's, I'm really curious to hear about your uh, reflections on uh, how you feel things are changing, particularly with with COVID. Because, you know, we have this, you know, we've had this sort of densification of, of cities and, you know, to be more efficient and all these things. And now uh, are we thinking differently about cities again? Are we thinking differently about how we manage the space? Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm hearing lots of different things and it's a curious question to see where, where we're responding to that. And how yeah, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of content flowing through my inbox on like the changing nature of public space because of COVID-19. But I think the most profound impact is that humanity has witnessed its impact on the world. You can see the Himalayas. You can see a blue sky over many cities that you couldn't have. Animals are inhabiting areas where they haven't been in the last, you know, how many, how many years. Um, that there is an awareness of the Anthropocene. We just saw it over the last few months about when we went in our, you know, when Mother Nature sent us to our rooms, <laughs> all of a sudden life came back into places where we were trying to dominate. Um, so that's something I think is a good lesson from COVID-19. Um, you mentioned, yeah, I think... Bio, we've talked about bioregional governance, and I think that is more important than city-states that we have bioregional governance, right? And not, you need to be close enough to the ecosystem services and biodiversity. It's not the political boundary. We talked about that. You know, we looked at the Aboriginal map, the living map of, of this country. It's, it's very different than um, the lines that were put into it by Westerners. Um, that's a huge component of this, and that does get into the food shed, the life shed, the water shed, and all these things that have to be we have to be custodians of and support with other living beings in that same area, um, and how food integrates in. Um, but we have to also start thinking about bringing you know, ecosystem services and biodiversity into the urban centers, right? So the notion of biophilia. And if you think about this, just this amazing emerging research on the neuroscience of cities, right? You have the, the neurobiology of nature we know from biophilia, but there's also this whole thing I was researching with friends at UTS on neuroaesthetics, and that in many ways we're pre-wired pre um, that nature, you know, like beauty is not always in the eye of the beholder. You know, our brains, our consciousness, our our a response to certain urban patterns, scale, you know, uh, all these different things play a role in our brains. Um, and the urban environment has a profound neurological impact on us. So we're just learning and studying this new emerging field of neuroaesthetics and how biophilia can transform human health and mindsets around, you know. Um, but, but that association and proximity to food that you can go out and pick a fruit tree on the sidewalk, you know, or... I can go in my backyard, you know, we talked about distributed farming. I mean, all that stuff is huge. And you can't look at all these things in isolation. So the food, energy, water, nexus movement is huge right now. You know, all of that has to be created in a systemic way to change what I'll call the life force, the things that make a city functional. Um, but, uh, but what I find interesting is that what Morak was speaking to, particularly through the lens of um, how does food connect us back to the patterns of the land um is is this the trap that when we talk about regenerative urbanism or we talk about regenerative cities and um, that somehow in the minds of too many people that actually then creates a sort of non-existent boundary which is the administ uh, administrative boundary of that city um rather than 
understanding from the beginning that a city always has to be deeply connected to its bioregion and that, um, that what, what I kind of heard Morak speaking to is is that it's it's permeable in the sense that the city's <laughs> radius of caring and intention of being of healing, salutogenic so impact of its region has to extend into the region and that has to dynamize the local economy and um, give opportunities to people who are choosing to live in a lower density um, suburban or, um, or rural environment that is in, in exchange with the city. And, and the city's economic and intellectual power and, and technological power needs to somehow enable people in those locations to be participants in, in that exchange. And then at the same time, it's this really deep questioning of our city's existing structures, as, as Joel Glansberg so beautifully puts it, that all of that attracts of underlying processes and, and that um, you can't just by changing the tracks change the underlying process. You have to get at the underlying process. And that, for me, is to these, these, like when, when Aboriginal Indigenous elders go to the center of Sydney, the sense of knowing the creek that is under the con concrete, of the song lines connecting so deeply back in time that, that there's actually a cultural memory still mm. of the dynamic to which our current city is a scab on the surface. And, and, and one that, that on Gaian timescales, that can be scratched off relatively quickly in beyond human timescales. And, and how do we avoid that by healing those ancient scars, by reopening the, the life-giving patterns in urban environments? Um, and, Liquid space. And it's, I mean, it's, it's that whole, like, uh, because, because you were talking a lot about Australia, I looked up this work that Herbert Girardi, who wrote the book on regenerative cities a few years back, he actually was a thinker in residence in Adelaide and um, made a series of suggestions that got implemented. And, and the way that he tells the story uh, really led to Adelaide being a great example of a city that managed to see itself in a bioregional context. Um, I don't know if you've, you've had any um, experience of, of his project. I just found this report. I haven't actually read it yet. Uh, but he also speaks about it in, in the report on regenerative cities that he did for the World Future Council and then on, on, in the book he wrote. Mm -hmm. But the, the last, I have also another question because you said something really, like at one point you mentioned that you'd briefly been to Florence or lived, lived a few months or years in Florence. And then you... Years. For a year. And then, then you said, I also lived most of my, or I lived most of my life on colonized ground. Mm -hmm. And I, I suddenly thought, no, what? You said Florence earlier. And so I, I, I suddenly wondered if you just are faced with this question spontaneously. Um, reflecting back on your lived experience in America and in Australia on colonized soil, and then that year in a place where it's not quite like that. And yet now moving towards Qatar, where, where you have, if anything, the colonization is in the mind of patterns that have come in from other cities, other from, from, from the globalization process, but you still have an indigenous culture trying to live in a pretty hostile place. Um, uh, have you, yeah, any, any reflections on, on that year in Florence and how it was different? Yeah, profoundly shaped my notion of cities because it was so walkable and beautiful. Beauty is such a crucial dimension to this conversation, right? We, we fight for things that we love because of beautiful. It's the reason why we put beauty as a credit in living building challenge, because if it's beautiful, people will fight to keep it in hundred years, right? It has the sense of timelessness and durability of, of human economies. Florence is just incredibly beautiful and like the, the whole, there's a sense of, there's a whole research we did on, and Istanbul was another one that profoundly impacted me, right? These other cities in the world. But this informal versus formal urbanization, informal urbanism, you know, the, the grassroots kind of way cities evolved and shaped organically over time. The stuff that Chris Alexander would touch on or see and, and write in his books versus this kind of industrial age view of the city and the gridiron and buildings and glass and steel what I'll call shape and drape age of architecture, shape it and drape it, <laughs> um, 
we're missing, you know, like that organic informality. Like it's symbols three thousand years old, and this, you know, Florence is probably as you know a thousand years old, or it might be. But the layers of the city, again, that story, that narrative, the chapters can keep reading, but the, the theme is there. Um, but the the, the urban compression of Florence is incredible. You have this maze medieval grid to get around. I can go five different ways to get to the same spot and get there within like 30 seconds, of, you know, each way of going. I love that. That's the kind of stuff that Jane was writing about in her book with Death and Life, Great American Cities. Um, so we're missing that kind of organic way of thinking about the Neary Roman grid, right? Like, we talk about it all the time, but how are we instilling some of that thinking into contemporary urban planning and design? Um, you know, the conversation you usually see is, uh, you know, we're going to build 15,000 new homes in this area. And like, well, have you actually done the biological care and capacity of that region can carry 15,000 new you know, homes? Um, but I'll bring it back to Doha. Um, I'm enormously excited about Doha because just in limited time I've been working with the Qatari people. You know, my whole perception of the Middle East and Arabian culture has been completely transformed. And I've found to be the most welcoming people I've ever encountered on, you know, in my life and all the places I've lived. Um, and this sense of integrity um, and generosity. You know, and, but you know, the, there's this kind of billboard urbanism. A, a lot of cities you know, copy-paste the Western skyline and build a replicated way of thinking about it and get starstruck by famous architects. And like, we got it. We got an Arm Foster building in our city. But when I see that, I'm like, you lost the plot. You lost your urban story. You're copying someone else's city and putting it in a place that probably doesn't have any cultural context or climate responsive way of evolving place. Um, so a lot of cities have made that mistake. And I look, there's an 80 story building going on somewhere in Paramount. I'm like, why? Um, that's the power politics we talked about in New York. That's the, the top-down drive change, right? So, but what I've learned in Australia, particularly from Chels, is start from culture. Um, and, you know, I see incredible opportunity in Doha and sense of pride in them rebuilding their country, um, looking at indigenous urbanism, drawing on their cultural past, drawing on their faith, to inform and influence how they shape the urban environment. Um, there's an incredible project that my company actually took on called Mishareb, which kind of has this incredible urban patterning and indigenous architecture that I immediately am struck. Like, I know this, you know, I see the identity of this place. I see its story, you know, I see its narrative. Um, but so I, I think, um, you know, starting from that culture and not trying to copy some other culture's way of thinking about cities is crucial. You know, place source potential that we talk about in regenerative practice is huge. I'm excited about how Doha is going to shape my next chapter in my life you know, and Qatari culture. Mm -hmm. um, but Florence had a profound impact on me, man. I, 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 I had to get in a fight with my dad because I got a scholarship to go over there and study for a year. It's the only way I could do it. Um, and I was the last one to leave. <laughs> and I, I wanted to stay. I didn't, I didn't want to go. I loved it. It's like living in a painting. Incredible. Like I said before, I mean, I mentioned earlier, the cities are a symptom of our culture and our way of thinking about environment, our built environments. So it's first developing, and this is how we teach regenerative practice, you're developing the mental model, and the, re the capacity to conceive of a regenerative city and change the way we think about and talk about infrastructure and buildings. But it's the underlying cultural dynamics. So the regenerative culture, you know, if we're building regenerative culture, out of that comes a different urban paradigm. And that's, you know, all the work we do to teach regenerative practice around the world, it's developing ourselves. That's why I focus on my own journey and how, you know, cities or people that I've, you know, read and love, probably people on this call right now, Carolyn, has influenced me profoundly. It's like I've had to shape a whole new perspective um, and mental models so that I can practice a different way of, of looking at cities or talking about these things. And Richard Florida's work was great when it came out. Um, it was completely missing the ecology of cities. 
Mm. Um, but it also fundamentally, you know, like creative class people were actually displacing a lot of local residents all over the world. So it became like this symb symbolism of gentrification. Mm. When a new coffee shop popped up or an art gallery that was like, dig in, we're going to fight for our community because this place is going to change to a hipsterville soon. Um, the smash abo became a, that symbol here, I think, in Australia. Um, so I think it starts with culture. It starts with what, what we value. You know, and there are some people in Australia that we've taken through the government and the high level planning um, that have started to embrace this new way of thinking about this and, you know, how that can start to change the trajectory of our region here. It's happening profoundly in New Zealand with Jacinda Ardern. Love her. She's amazing. Um, actually, anywhere there's like a female government leader right now, things are amazing here. <laughs> Are happening really in a more progressive way. Um, so it, yeah, it starts with the mental model, it starts with the culture. I wouldn't. It, the, the building is a, is a symptom of the way we're thinking. The architecture is a symptom of the way we're thinking. It's changing the way we think first. So maybe Daniel talk about regenerative culture as a tie that in. Well, I think it, the question that you posed can um, is actually. Yeah, as Jason alluded to, the, it, it's upstream in the mind that we need to. Once we see cities as leaving, breathing organisms, then we can have the humility of getting out of the way when we need to, and the audacity of being, of attempting to be of healing, salutogenic, abundance generating influence in that ecosystem as participants, not as designers of. So, so it's, it's kind of, we, that's the paradox of designing regenerative cultures um, or the regenerative cities, that on the one hand, there is an intentionality and there is acting on the complex dynamic system that, that we're participating in, that is a living system, yes or yes. But um, at the same time, understanding that what the end result is, is not going to be exactly like something that has been of, on the drawing board of some architect or some planner. The end result is emergent from all the relationships that the place has as to itself. To and and so really, living cities, to my mind, is asking does it contribute to the health and wholeness of the community of people and the community of life in this place i, I actually think the four questions that that um the the thriving places methodology that um jason was talking about earlier that that kate rayworth has developed i i have them here what would it mean for people for the people um, of this city to thrive, question number one. What would it uh, would would it mean for the city to thrive within its natural habitat? Number two. So that's building the the, the bridge. What would it mean for the city to respect the well-being of people worldwide? Putting the city in context, so we don't build regenerative islands in a in a degenerating world and what would it mean for the city to respect the health and um, of the whole planet so actually bringing in a she's asking four questions which is how do you generate regenerative cultures you start with the questions you live the questions in place together and she's actually with just four questions building the bridge between human well-being and the wider context of life well-being which we're part of and the equity context of how do we meet our needs in this place making this place thrive within the limits of the planetary boundaries and in ways that actually help other places to thrive too um okay, we're just so coming back to life okay i'll, I'll shut up <laughs> Over to so, many people so desmond here. has a question um does desmond are you ready to go ahead uh, unmute yourself um, can can I ask people to keep your questions or your comments so you don't have to limit yourself to questions. You might have a profound comment, um, but keep them as short as possible so we can get through as many contributions as we can. Over to you, Desmond. Okay, I dropped a question in the Q and A in the in the past one in the in the in the past part of the webinar webinar, mm -hmm. um, and. 
I got two questions really. One is is the question I dropped in about uh, in the last webinar, which was in Qatar is there's a World Cup football World Cup coming up, and the uh, conditions of the immigrant labour there are quite appalling. And I wondered what uh, uh, Jason had to did he have any thoughts on that? That was one question. The other, the other question is is a little less um, controversial, I suppose. It's just that it, is there a a, um, a kind of uh, a per urban apostle uh, chapter, maybe in uh, in Victoria or in Melbourne, that uh, I can make some connection with. Oh yeah, there's some incredible people in Melbourne I can connect you to. Um, but I'll take on the human rights issues in Qatar first. Um, yeah. And that my perception, that was a big issue going back to 2013. Um, but it was my limited understanding of what was happening there through a filtered Western media lens. Um, and since I've had the time to really spend time there and speak to people, learn what they've accomplished in the last seven years, it's phenomenal. It's now a case study for human rights. So the International Human Rights Watch, other groups, International Labor Organization, are looking at Qatar as a, as a case study example. Um, yes, there is some you know issues in them emerging as an economy. I think 1970. It's only 50 years old as a country. Think about the evolution of countries and human rights movements over the last thousand years or so, 500 years. They've done it in 50. And how they pivoted and learned and worked with the international community is actually incredible. Um, I just actually spoke with the um, human rights lead for the for the Supreme Committee, and it's amazing what they've done. I'm, I'm impressed, like incredibly impressed. Um, and one of my best friends is the CEO for the Center for Sports and Human Rights in Geneva, um, and she's been, you know, advising me on what they've accomplished, and it's incredible. Um, they should be applauded. Um, it, it, you know, you think about also some of the criticism that countries like that get are from countries that bore their wealth on the backs of slavery and stolen land from First Peoples as well. So you have to take those judgments with a grain of salt sometimes. Hmm. Um, not that it justifies any means contemporary today, but um, I think from an emerging country and what they've done is um, pretty amazing. Oh dear. Sorry. Thank you, everybody. I've been enjoying the series. I'd like to ask anybody this question. Um, how would you suggest that one, someone like me, who's very concerned and active in environmental things and working, trying to work on the local level as well um, in a multicultural way, but how do I connect with what's below that scab, Jason, that, um, in Sydney? With, how do I connect to, you know, I live near Centennial Park. Yes, I can, I know the eels can swim to, you know, um, Japan. But how do I get that feeling, the indigenous, the, the land underneath and how it was before? And I've always, you know, I've sat on double-decker buses in Sydney as a, a young, as a child and sort of imagined what it might have been like. But is there anywhere or any one or do you suggest a way of doing that? How do I do that? I mean, simply... Um, you could go, Marsha Langston, I think her name is, wrote the book Welcome to Country. Yeah, that's, basically, that's I love the book. Yeah. yeah, that's a great yeah. book because there's so many different things in Sydney that I wouldn't know about unless I Oh, so Sydney is in that book, is it? I thought Absolutely. it was all, oh, good. okay. Uh, oh, that's a good start. You can, yeah, you can go down to the Aboriginal Land Council in Redfern and meet uh -huh. who runs it and they do t walking tours and, and go historical walking tours of, of Sydney and, you know, right. where the sacred sites are and how it all works. Okay. But, but that book is, that book has all the different ways of tapping into yeah. indigenous Sydney, like, which is still a thriving living culture. It's incredible. Right. Makes so you sense. all suggest that, that that's a really good starting point for having that regenerative yep. space, mind, creative beginning for this journey? That you're all on. I do. I also recommend um, tapping into the regenerative practitioner stuff. So there's a, a course that's being taught around the world. Some people I know have called been through it. 
Um, and that's a really strong um, component in Australia and New Zealand in particular. I know Lucy's, Lucy's on the call. Lucy, why don't you share a bit about how you've hosted it in, in Auckland? Talk Thank you. Kia ora, kia ora, um, <coughs> ko Lucy tukua tēnei no Aotearoa. Um, I, just, I guess I was itching to respond to your question in particular, and um, if somebody was to ask that question of me here in Auckland, in New Zealand, um, I would invite you to, to my place and to help me wash the dishes and to look after the kids and um, to experience just the things that we do um, as Indigenous peoples. And so, um, you know, going to what we call kōhanga and just volunteering your time um, and being with the people of the land um, and having that experience in a really tangible way um, that isn't told in a book. Um, it's, it's, it's those lived experiences, hearing the language, you can't hear that in the book. Um, but the program that Jason was talking about, um, we started a regenerative practitioner program here in New Zealand about four, four years ago, and I was the co host um, at that time. And how we do it in New Zealand is different to how everybody else does it around the world. And so it's really, uh, when I was co-hosting, we get the entrenched in our culture. Um, and so um, I'm not uh, familiar with who's running the program over there, but always kind of happy to connect um, and share the journey that we've been on uh, here, in, here in New Zealand. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> Your sister. I just, yeah, I was, I was just going to add, you know, that, thanks, Lucy, that's, uh, you know, I just think that just slowing down and spending time in the land and spending time with people who are connected to the land and just being at a different pace that you can hear it and you can feel it because there's one thing filling up your mind with all the information about it, but until it kind of seeps into your being and you connect with other people in that way, it still just stays as as a as a one dimensional type of knowing. So I would yeah, slow down and get your hands dirty. <laughs> I, I might just quickly mention here um, the experience of a friend of mine who was involved in a bush re regeneration group in the city, um, the at Matraville, and uh, when they began their work, they thought oh, we should, um, out, just out of respect, we should go and, and uh, let the, uh, the Indigenous people at, at um, La Perouse know that we're doing this. And so they, they did that, and it's blossomed into a wonderful relationship in which the, uh, the, the people at La Perouse are telling the stories of the land to those people who we're just going to go and do some weeding and, you know, plant some uh, native species, and suddenly it's become a cultural immersion. And it, it, it to me, it just seemed like a, a, a wonderful uh, transition that happened from uh, a, a very small and modest initiative. Uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I just have one offering, um, kind of following this thread that's there, that an entry point to being with yourself, kind of coming from where Morag was speaking about, is to ask the question, um, how am I in the environment and how is the environment in me? Just as a point of kind of departure for reflection when you are in an environment as a way to enter into a different experience of it. Um, that's just an offering that is sitting with me. My question is actually more for Jason around process. I'm really interested in what innovations and creative approaches that 
you might have encountered that help facilitate the necessary kind of transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary dialogues and collaborations that are central to regenerative practice like given that a lot of the kind of like engaging it especially at like a hyper local level um local government still remains quite siloed in their own structures so i have a curiosity about that yeah i mean the from a pro process is crucial so the framework i use that i i kind of I've drawn from all my mentors in the world and people have influenced me is a framework that goes mental model. So one, you have to help educate the, the mindset of the team. And that we talked about a bit when Shell Chells or someone like Lucy can do that. Like they come in and they help create an indigenous way of thinking about a project um, or a different perspective on seeing a project. Cultivate that mental model is step one. Step two is governance and culture. So usually when, I mean, you, you got to get into the reality of how things are designed and built today. You know, some of your, I've been in meetings where the first meeting for a project is like how many cars can be found on the site? The opposite of regenerative development. So having the, this, this process of discovery up front, discovering who we are, what our values are, how do we capture that? How do we work with, with the community, not do something to the community, but work with the community? How do we draw that out? as a major starting point to create the fertile ground to, to, to influence the design response from is crucial. Process is the third ring in that. Um, and the integrated design process or whole systems thinking and way of designing and conceiving and planning the environments is crucial. Um, and that is, you know, we, we, we are in this age of specialization still, right? So it used to be like a master builder era leading up into like the 20s and 30s where maybe take like 13 drawings to build a train station right now we have like you know you know bench designers on team like you know there's like a, a myriad of players and specialists that have emerged in the 20th century to, to kind of from i would say from a legal perspective all these specializations created is really interesting like how you how do you manage that as a, as a, as a collective mindset of teams is crucial. And, we, and it's really, really important. So I, I have to be an arbiter of change as a developer or project director on teams to ensure that people get out of their siloed ways of seeing the project. Right? So making sure I'm asking the landscape architect if that design of the architecture is actually good for the landscape. Right? And like, sometimes it pisses the architect off. <laughs> Or I'm asking the engineer if that's the most efficient way, the most efficient form of the building, right? It's giving everyone a way to help collectively shape space and not just fall into siloed you know, special specialties. I remember asking an architect in Seattle, you know, ask, ask the engineer where, where is the best place to locate things. It's typically, we design something and then they just hand it over to the engineers and you put your kid on top <laughs> or wherever is left over. But ask the engineer to design the building in a way that makes it way more efficient and passively designed and, and, and get the foundations of regenerative you know, energy and, and water systems in, in place. Um, and a lot of times the architect looked over at me like, like a way that I'm not allowed to talk to the engineer without going to the architect. Um, and that's not all architects. Architects are amazing. You know, they're all different. Um, but there's, you, know, you have to change that dynamic of how the team thinks. And after you get through process, then you have tools. Um, there's incredible, that's why I mentioned technology and how we use like GIS mapping or, you know, what Revit or other design systems can do to give influence, better decision making up front. So in an integrated design, the earlier you make decisions up front, the less risk and cost happens down the way. So there's a whole way of managing a project and the process that enables us to deliver more performance and better quality outcomes for less cost and risk. And it's, but that's a training that has to happen. And I know that's happening in New Zealand because of my mate over there has been teaching it for a long time, but you, you cannot do a living building without doing integrated design. Like Caroline Piddock would know that on the call. Um, you have to have this process because that enables the outcomes that we're talking about. Um, and then the last one is just products and technologies. 
because we tend to always kind of gravitate to the shiny new object and the new technology that's coming out and use that to design space around instead of really staying within that hierarchy. Mental model, governance and cultures, process, tools, products. So I think that's, that's the process I've used in my career that I've, I've kind of stitched together with my, my friends and colleagues around the world, and it's, it's worked. I know that I was building projects in Seattle that were achieving living building when my, my colleagues were doing lead gold, and I was doing it for less money. So I know it's possible when you have the right, but that, that also included the governance. And you mentioned local government being siloed. Um, so I would say another really good example to look at is eco districts because eco districts it came out of Portland at the same time we we're doing living buildings, but more district scale. And it does empower grassroots community action, but it links government, community and industry all together under one strategy. So you have this kind of like um, collaborative governance model to help communities shape places with industry and government. So it's not again done to them but the community has a much stronger voice in how their community evolves. That's a really good, eco districts is a really good framework for that. A number of people had put questions on the Q and A in the webinar. I know Oliver, you did. Um, and there were a few others. So if you want to ask any of those questions that you posted in the Q and A, now's the time to do it. Shall I say something? Yes, please. Uh, the question I put was uh, around the idea that we live in a complicated world. We're looking for strategies for uh, building better cities, better countries, uh, happier people, and all of the things that we've talked about today. And the problem I'm engaged with all the time with the work that I do is that it's the external environment in which we operate which seems to me to be the challenge. You know, yesterday, Donald Trump told us they are not protesters, they are anarchists. You know, and, and when you hear that coming f f as a political voice, you suddenly get a sense of the enormity of the challenge which faces us. So the question I put up earlier was to say this. There are lots of examples of great developments being done, pioneered by people like Jason and Daniel around the world, but how do we join up the dots? How do we actually make the work that we're involved with have some political clout so that it actually will change the external environment in which politicians are acting? So that's my, I see that as the big challenge. Have you guys, have you guys read Blessed Unrest by Paul Hawken? It's a good one because he, you know, in his research, he was studying movements and community groups and nonprofits and just the sheer enormity of that world, of the NGO world or third sector world. And, and, he, and he wrote it, it was probably 10 years ago now, but he said it's the largest movement ever, but they don't even know it's a movement yet. I think what Trump, you know, is lifted the lid on in America, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, the other crises that we're dealing with as, as a species. I think, um, yes, we, have, we can be proactive and engage and try and push our local politicians or federal politicians to, to move in a different direction, but I think the movement is bigger than us individually. Um, I was listening to a podcast on the Enlightenment today, and I always feel like, um, I feel like we're on the precipice of a new, a new enlightenment that's, that the world's never seen before. And it's this emergence of, of who we are as a species. I mean, I mentioned in one of the previous calls that, or previous you know, talks that I thought 2012 with the Mayan long can calendar was going to be a rebirth of human consciousness, right? An awakening, right? There's been many human awakenings in the past and past movements that have profoundly shifted humanity. Unfortunately, the last one shifted us into a Cartesian worldview and separated us from nature and all these other things have emerged from it, like, you know, Adam Smith and economics and GDP and everything that's put us in this place. So I think a new emergence is happening and you'll see it. I'm hoping I see it in my lifetime. I'm pretty sure I will. Because I, I just see these patterns of all these things we're seeing now. If you look at it from a whole, 
is humanity responding almost to the as an immune system to the disease of the problems we've created for ourselves. Um, does anyone else want to tackle that? Maybe I'll, I'll come in a little bit. Um, I think it's a real and important question to ask, and I think a lot of people are asking it in, in different... Like, I've, I've had conversations with people in, in business leadership roles that, that are saying, how, how can I transform my company's activities towards having a truly regenerative impact if I'm still playing within a playing field that is a zero-sum game that, that is incentivizing people to um, abuse people and planet in order, and, and actually they have an advantage if they do so. And so for, for me, there is this, um, we've talked about a number of times, this beautiful image of, of we're hospicing a world that is no longer fit for purpose and we're midwifing a world that is fit for, for, for purpose at the same time. And that dual role means that you have to know which, which battles to fight and when. Like the, I feel like that system that you're alluding to, the, the, the empire of um, Trump and um, what he's doing with, with um, like literally the city that, that Jason ma uh, mentioned, Portland, is under siege by um, unmarked sort of not even government forces. Um, so I, I sense we, we need to know that this is the time where to strengthen the local networks and where to still be open to the people who are somehow trapped in the dying system, see them with the compassion of midwifing, not as the old system to fight, but really opening the door to the human potential that is in every single person that used to be stuck in a big corporate wheel or the, the, the mills of government and, and begin to engage them as human beings and saying we're, we're actually all part of this planetary immune response. And um, we, I, I, I feel like we need to hold the vision that Jason is speaking to, that we are at the brink of a new transformation of the human presence on Earth. And we need to be brutally honest with the, the dark side that is still there and, and, and just sit in that mess for a while, um, but in the trust that uh, it's not 100% the outcome that matters. It's our way of being with this transformative situation that, that will make the difference. I think the difficulty is that if you take Sydney as a place and our governments, there are two of them. There's the council uh, and the various councils, local government and the state. They operate as giant property businesses. That's what they're property corporations 90% of the time. Uh, and the problem with the, and with the metaphor, which is nice, the midwife metaphor, is you don't want to be a midwife to a, a, a baby that's going to be stillborn because the environment in which that is happening is totally unconducive to achieving the kind of aims that we feel should be part of our vision. Jason, you've done work with uh, those bodies in Sydney. Do you want to reflect on that? Yep. Happy to. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, Australia is a very corporatized country. And it's the first place that I was called a customer from a government, not a citizen, but a customer. <laughs> um, and it is also the most profoundly strong lobbying industry of any real estate industry I've ever encountered. Like I can see that real estate and property have their foot on the neck of government in this country, which is sad for communities. Um, and big, bad urban regeneration kind of runs run shot over historic communities all over the place here. Um, there's just a lack of diversity. I don't know if it's the scale of the country, but also the governance model. And some people prefer to have centralized state government because of organization. Some people want power back to the city you're seeing a devolution of power back to cities because they're closer to the ground of how you manage urban environments. Um, Sydney is an interesting, Waterloo is an interesting test case, right? I've been on Waterloo projects for five years, helping plan that. And it was a, ma a monumental exercise and incredible people involved with the power politics between state and city erode the potential of what that place could be and who's right or who's wrong, who's, who's more advanced thinker on cities, who knows how to do this. 
Um, so I think that the governance of cities and states and, the, and the, I guess the, the tension between the two here is a problem because you can see it emerge in brick and mortar here. Um, transportation is another one. <laughs> um, but it's challenging and we're, we're trying to do, so I specialize in land trusts and co-housing and cooperative housing and we've been trying for four years to do projects here. You think we're getting any traction? No, nope. but we're already 40 years behind the rest of the world on this stuff. It's like, you know, we don't have a very diverse, from a housing perspective, we have a very undiverse housing system. We have basically a bilateral system, you rent or you own, where there's like a myriad of different housing choices in different countries. Um, so, and you don't have built to rent here, which has been around for hundreds of years or else. So it, there's some challenges that have to emerge, but the potential is enormous. Um, there's amazing people working on that to make changes happen. Um, I know Tom is on the call here. He knows about Nightingale. Um, Caroline has been involved in stuff up in that regard. But we have to vote. I don't want to say you guys have to vote because I'm leaving. <laughs> but, you know, the government, the government has to change its way of working with community. There's, I mean, and it's, it's, not like, it's not a blanket stereotype statement. There are some really incredible local councils. I'm in one with West. Blue Mountains wants to do some profoundly incredible stuff. So it's a matter of kind of going where the energy of change wants to happen in government. Um, and there's different divisions of government, like the government architects here, incredible. They do incredible stuff. It's just a matter of enabling them to fulfill their vision and get it built into our communities. Um, but the, uh, the dynamics of politics at that level is, is tough. So, uh, Philippa, I think, I'm sorry you've been waiting for so long, but your turn. <laughs> Thanks, Kenneth. Um, Jason touched on it a little, but it was just really around the technology issue with technologies progressing at uh, developing at such a rate, how we, you know, embrace appropriate technologies and, and choose between them. And I have to say, I've been quite relieved not to hear the word smart city. And um, I don't know whether it's a question, comment or plea but you know the issue of electromagnetic radiation and its incompatibility with biological life so if we're wanting to be in cities and we're wanting to invite nature back into cities um you know apart from the electromagnetic radiation issue how do we sort of yeah steer that fine line between embracing what's coming online but also discerning what's inappropriate and, and incompatible with our vision um, I like to use the word wise city to distinguish it from smart city because it's equitable and inclusive and not technology driven. Um, I mean, smart cities were so, I, it, I don't know how it came back in such a fad, but it was like, that was like, that was like the 2010s and IBM and Microsoft pushing all their, their stuff. Um, I mean, technology has a role, but again, mental model, governance, culture, process, tools, products and technologies down here. So, if, you know, again, how you use the right way to select that right technology um, is really, really important. Um, but it's, I mean, look at Google. Sidewalks Lab just got kind of failed in their attempt to do like the smartest city community in Toronto. And last month they announced they're pulling out of the project because they forgot about people, the local people. Um, a valiant, valiant attempt by them. Um, I have friends who work there and they're really smart and they, they did their best, but it was missing that kind of, it felt like, you know, the big giant corporation trying to control the city. Um, and I do worry about technology in our, our everyday lives and families. I mean, I, I have, if not, anyone has kids on the call, we're all always concerned about how much time they spend on their phone. Um, we did a talk on this last year and I'm, I'm in the camp like I want less technology in my life I want more nature in my life but what, I mean I want to hang out with Morag and her permaculture community um, being in an urban environment is stimulating enough when you layer in more technology and technology that observes us some is good some is bad um, is, is an interesting experiment and we're, if you think about humanity in 200,000 years living in this type of density is relatively new for our species and we're evolving still to adapt to this new urban 
way of living. Um, and technology kind of changes our way of living in cities. It's great. It's, I mean, it's good and bad. Um, when I totally lost my train of thought, there's something else I wanted to say about that. I can't feel like I'm forgetting. I'll, get, I'll come back to it and I'll send something in the chat to you. But, um, uh, Daniel. Um, for, for me, this, it's such a nice edge, this question, because they, on the one hand, I really believe that um, Goethe, over 200 years ago, like when somebody else was saying, what methodologies can you um, use to get back to understanding and reading landscape? Uh, in the in the Western lineage, um, Goethean science and the phenomenological approach to um, being in landscape and being with other um, non-human nature um, has tried to also be able to read patterns of landscape or read a plant. But, but Goethe said many, many years ago that he who doesn't see nature everywhere will see her nowhere in the right light. And um, Jason was in his opening remarks saying that cities are nature and also that, that we, we need to somehow embrace and, and find a healthy relationship with technology. Mm -hmm. And as hesitant as I am, because I know there are a bunch of nutters in Singularity University that would like to download consciousness on the microchip and all these crazy um, Hans Moravec and Ray Kurzweil versions of the Singularity. But, but ultimately, we do need to address, because even in Jason's uh, answer, it, as long as we make technology out there and nature here, we're, we're still separating something. If we're understanding that all technologies are part of the biophysical complex dynamic transforming system that we also came out of, then as perverse as it might sound, a nuclear power plant and an atomic bomb is also part of that pro process that if we understand nature correctly. And then we need to look at these technologies as are they adaptive or are they maladaptive? Do they lead to futuring or defuturing? And we need to then revisit the magnificence of a seed, of an acorn turning into an oak, of my daughter turning from two cells meeting into this dynamic, exploring, constantly changing, almost three-year-old human being that, that is just a miracle every second of the mm. time I engage with her. And if we have the audacity to think that our technologies are also advanced and we compare them to the true technologies of nature or the indigenous technologies of how to be in place in right relationship over 40,000 years in your country. We need to readdress what technology is and basically put this, what we call technology, in its place, which is complete kitty hawk, beginning of something that most of it is actually going in the wrong direction. Um, so, so it's... I think one of the most crucial questions for the future of humanity of how do we on the one hand, embrace technologies, but really have the ethical conversations about what technologies to use, when and where, and stop thinking that exponential tech a la Silicon Valley is inevitable. Um, I'll get off my hobby horse. Uh, Elizabeth wanted to say something. And, uh, show, and uh, when you were talking to the question about appropriate technology, I start, in my mind, I sort of started heading towards the question of scale, which is something that's come up for me a lot throughout this conversation is scale like what what is an appropriate scale for a human habitat for a city at what scale do we actually start to go beyond the limits of of it being able to be embedded regeneratively within that landscape and to maintain those relationships and i know within the bigger scale we can have uh, you know, like villages within villages and and districts, and and we can we can kind of have that, but there becomes a point where they're just too big. And uh, you know, my mind is also going to some of the cities that I've visited in in Africa, and many of the cities around the world which are just getting way too big that they've just completely lost their capacity to to maintain themselves or to have any kind of system that functions. Um, so I just wanted to to bring that scale question in. And it's also a scale of, you know, when Jason was talking about Florence, I think part of why that was such a beautiful, why it is such a beautiful place and have a, such a beautiful experience is because it's that connectedness with, with scale, walkability and the, the height of it and the, and the, the closeness. And it, there's a human natural scale 
there. And uh, so I'd really like just to bring that into it because it does relate to uh, the technologies that we use into the design. And also, um, as Jason was talking about his process, about, you know, the architect asking the landscape architect and the, uh, and I'm, Without going into it more, Jason, and I'm gathering this is what the mindset's about. It's actually firstly thinking about the place and the landscape and how that then informs what anything might be before it even begins. Because um, coming from a, a kind of a, a more land-based perspective, I always feel like it's kind of an afterthought that you fit it around. But if it emerges out of that place and the, and the place determines the scale, that we can start to think differently as well. Yes, I think this question of scale is so important to us. We see it in the, uh, the um, renewable energy field where there are advocates of renewal e renewable energy who are advocating huge capital intensive uh, projects that replicate many of the problems of highly centralized grid uh, power stations um, simply by their scale uh, when we need to be thinking constantly I mean it's subsidiarity how do we bring uh, our activities and our decision making back to the level where they have their application and that means distributed systems rather than centralized systems Elizabeth over to you you're muted Yes, I got there. Um, thank you. It, I just got really excited when Daniel was talking about technologies and then also thinking about, you know, the technologies that we've created as a species in comparison to the kind of, I guess, natural technology of, of us as a species and of our whole biosphere. Um, because I think of my work, I'm an artist and I'm, something that I do innately. Um, I have Maori heritage and it's been innate for me to just weave. And I think and I reflect on weaving as one of the most, if not the most ancient technologies that still exists mm. and has been a continued tradition for humans and our nature. And it is something that has grown from our relationship to environment and, and then it was sort of still coming through as Morag was speaking as well because it, the process of weaving really is about a conversation that you have with the environment and you're collecting the materials of your environment and bringing those threads together into something that, and in my work I weave with plastics and I always think about and speak about the scale and intricacy with which those materials are woven into the fabric of our society. And I just couldn't help but think, you know, is, is weaving like a metaphor that can really guide us and is weaving as like this really ancient technology, something that metaphorically can guide us into this future of how we integrate and, and interweave technologies into um, our lives and into these practices. This is just my thoughts. Very quick answer, just my personal direct. I believe that our challenge is to reweave ourselves into the fabric of life mm -hmm. in a way that is supporting the health and wholeness of place and place being fractal from the, the, the land our feet touch and where we stand on to, to the whole planet and beyond. And, and I think that, that that bridge into the ancient art of weaving is, is a beautiful bridge into indigenous cultures. And they, like in the world of education, um, that metaphor has actually already been, been taken on as a central metaphor of how to transform um, the educational landscape for the 21st century. There's, a, there's an initiative called the um, Global Change Leaders, which Ashoka initially started off and um, they had a meeting a couple of years ago um, all around that theme of weaving. And out of that, a um, guy called Ross Hall, who used to work for Ashoka and now has founded something called Weaving Labs, if you Google it. Um, and so, so I, and in, in coming from the eco-village movement, Morak and I 
the, the, the notion of a weaver has been in eco-village education for 20 years um, because Jason was talking about the silos where in the, the other bit of weaving we need to do is to weave the, 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 the golden threads of the different expert silo disciplines that we have into a fabric where each one of them can give the best they can have have to offer without saying that they're the only way of seeing things like it's it's weaving multiple perspectives and multiple ways of knowing as well into us being humble participants in that larger tapestry that that um we've always been that that we're we are the weavers and we are the woven ones, as the beautiful song um, says, but um, we need to remember that and then um, weave more consciously. So I, lo I love that metaphor. So we're rapid rapidly running out of time, I'm afraid. So if there's anyone who hasn't spoken and would like to make a comment or a question, Martha. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, so I feel I'm shifting sort of the mood, but um, I wanted to first thank Jason. Your description of New York completely uh, uh, reflected what I experienced moving there in the 1980s from a fatherless suburb of Boston. Mm -hmm. So, um, and now I live in Switzerland, a completely different world. But my question was what your thoughts are on, I mean, I have clearly my own ideas, but on the importance of local manufacturing. I come from textile and apparel, and I've watched my industry just uh, completely dissipate <laughs> and all of the cultural traditions in the UK and the US and everywhere. So um, do you have thoughts on the importance of local manufacturing and sourcing? I do, I do. Um, and there, you know, it's a two-sided coin of globalization, and some have been really beneficial to communities around the world, and some have been absolutely awful. Um, but I also think about this from an energy perspective, you know, we're going into this era where we have to think about heavy, near, light, far. So anything really heavy, you know, should be made locally and light stuff should, should travel. So there's just a simple way of thinking about heavy, near, light, far. And as we're designing cities and communities and economies, that principle will become more and more important as we go in further into the 21st century. Um, when we're hitting peak oil, we're hitting all these other things, you know, like, I uh, you know Janine Benyus, so we talked about, you know, the, the beauty of nature and how nature is our teacher. Janine taught me that. Um, and they, you know, they, they're trying to solve with green chemistry, how do you make solar panels without fossil fuels? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you extract the minerals you need? How do you ship them around the world? How do you heat them and make them and build them? You know, we're going to go back, you know, like, you know, how are we going to do that? I mean, we're trying to look at a creative ways that you can, you know, mimic photosynthesis without mm -hmm. heating, beating, and, and pillaging of the earth to make it. Um, but that principle is going to be more and more important. So I do believe in local manufacturing, um, particularly given, I think COVID-19 is going to actually help accelerate that because of the way that disrupted supply chains have impacted us. <laughs> Maybe there'll be a toilet paper manufacturer locally here. <laughs> Who knows? But um, it's a really important one. And it's also about, you know, local economic resilience. You know, it's, it's going to be crucial. We're not going to have the luxury of flying things across the world. Are there, you know, Daniel probably researches this. Are they still looking at airships out there as, a, as an alternative? <laughs> Flight? Um, but we're still it, kind of grasping. It unfortunately, it, it folded the, the German airship project, but eventually it'll come back. Just I, I don't want to talk long. Martha, have a look at fibershed.org. Oh, really Rebecca Burgess is my goddess. <laughs> Thank you. No, and this, uh, this is the model. I mean, she's amazing. And um, I keep, uh, I feel a little bit as if I'm a little bit of a lone uh, voice, except I'm, I uh, thanks to Fibershed can completely show um, that they put so much research into different models. So it's really backed up by science and technology. And I think in terms of having, having um, just finished the Capra course um, and thinking in systems, for me, the, the, an old factory, like the 186-year-old factory that is now closing in eastern Switzerland that has been weaving for, yeah, 186 years, it's sort of like the mother tree of an ancient forest. When a factory closes, 
there's so many other lives that are impacted. And um, so I'm trying to, you know, and it can be as, as um, uh, Elizabeth was saying, I mean, I believe in high tech, low tech, where it's appropriate to do things by hand, we should do them by hand. And I believe local manufacturing actually is something that should be done in, in Bangladesh, in all these countries that are producing cheap clothing for us. Really, we could be helping them to set up the infrastructure for their own economies. They don't really want to be manufacturing for export. Um, so it's a, it's a model I'm working on, and I'm just looking for – I was wondering if you have any um, – Jason, the uh, Municipal Art Society years ago before I left New York did a big, um, they had a big uh, event talking about the importance of manufacturing. And um, yeah, I'm just, look, I'm sort of piecing together uh, references that Fibershed is great. I'm trying to create a local fiber economy in Switzerland. Um, but um, yeah, Gara per Alperovitz talking about um, cooperatives. What we what I learned in the economic model of Gaia last round was um, about yeah the importance of um, all of these things peer to peer. And, and there's so many beautiful models, and I'm just sort of trying to pull them together as a person from the fashion industry, where it's like about as siloed as it gets. <laughs> so. Um, Miami, yeah, thank you. Mimicry just released regenerative fashion program last week. Who did? Biomimicry Institute just released oh, yeah, yeah. a regenerative fashion initiative. It's awesome. Um, I studied. I studied fashion in New York, so I I love what you're talking. Did about. you? <laughs> Me <laughs> too. <laughs> um, but it's a hugely important issue, and the other. But it's it's again, it's a governance issue because. Re residential real estate has been bulldozing through light manufactured areas of cities for the last 50 years and eroding that cultural capital and that, that, that local manufacturing capability. Um, there's some really amazing work that was just done in Sydney in the last year around making sure we maintain that. And Sydney's actually taken a, a good, created like a um, zone in their industrial area to protect that area. Um, it's such a crucial component because economies are changing so fast. Those buildings are needed and be adapted to for future uses. Um, but we can't just build luxury condominiums or, you know, apartments all over the world and displace all that. It's crucial. I'm sorry, but I need to go. Me too. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Bye-bye. Fantastic conversation. Great questions and good seeing everybody. It's great to see everybody. It's, it's weird when it's just the four of us on screen. Ken, you're muted. Ken, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder why everyone was being so unresponsive. <laughs> um, so we're, we're just about to wind up. I was going to ask Daniel if he wanted to say anything, and in fact I did, but he didn't hear me and neither did anyone else. So, um, uh, Morag, do you want to make any quick uh, final observations before we finish? And then I'm going to ask Dan, uh, Jason if he has any uh, words of wisdom left after the many he's already given us. Morag? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ken, and thanks everyone for being here and, and being on this journey with us. I know those of us who've been part of this roundtable have thoroughly enjoyed getting together every couple of weeks and having these conversations, and it really feels like there is an absolute need to be rethinking. And even since we started this conversation, started planning these conversations, that things have changed so much that even how we were thinking about change is changing. Uh, so, um, you know, this, this concept of scale, this concept of, of, re of regeneration, this concept of connecting with land in community, thinking differently about how we meet our, our needs uh, is, is really a, a critical thing. And, and as our economy is shifting and changing and as, as people are looking for ways to be more home base that changes again how we want to inhabit our spaces and so I think our cities um, in this next little while we'll see some changes in how how we want to inhabit this space and I, I, who knows actually where it's going to go but I, I think it's time to be incredibly uh, responsive and to be 
and to be really engaging in this opportunity to to think differently and to think regeneratively. Thank you, Morag, and thank you for your contribution for these five, these four sessions and the extra one that you did on growing our future, which I commend to everyone. So, Jason, final word from you. Yeah, I'm going to draw on some of our dialogue of the last month, but that, that journey I shared with you over the last you know, 20 years, two decades, um, coincided with also with my personal journey in sobriety, which I celebrated 19 years, two weeks ago. And there's a strong correlation for how the 12 step program has changed my way of thinking and the importance of how we change our way of thinking about regenerative development. It's a mindset shift and it's a daily reprieve and I have to work on it every day. And I get up, I think I shared one of the previous ones that, you know, I, I, a trick I use for myself or a tool I use is I get up in the morning and I say, I belong to the earth and I'm in service to life and it helps shape the way I'm going to engage my family, my community, my workplace, my colleagues, my friends. Um, and we had an interesting dialogue. You know, it's, it's a bit of decolonizing of the mind. And one of my uh, Aboriginal brothers, Tyson down in Melbourne, came up with this idea as we're I'm talking about this on a call a few weeks ago and he, he, he drafted Anthropoholics Anonymous, like 12 steps for the Anthropocene, you know, and how we are changing our consciousness and our connection to each other and to life on this planet. Um, so there's some really strong correlations there. So it's, you know, it's, we talk about technology, we talk about buildings, but it's all about shifting our consciousness and our connection to each other and place and life. That is the most important one. And I've been very grateful to have friends and family and people on this call that have, have been part of my journey and influenced my way of thinking and how I work in the world and how I be in the world. So thank you all for your sharing your time with us over the last few weeks. And it's gracious of you. Um, thanks for your questions and contributions. Um, and we'll see you soon. We'll see you at another event sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank all. You. Thank you, Jason. You're thanks all. such an important part of this um, of this roundtable series and good luck with your your next the next chapter in your urban odyssey thank you good luck brother thanks buddy <laughs> take care everybody